A hoax email. If it, so we've got a group known for for perpetrating stunts. And here we have our vaunted and respected state controlled media falling for it sit without even checking it out. The internet is just a sewer. It seems to me they get most of their news from that sewer these days. We're here with this special file sharing edition of the Yes Men Fix the World. Yeah, and this is a special edition because we have another film to show you first, one that you won't see anywhere else because we're being sued by the United States Chamber of Commerce. And as part of their lawsuit, they have demanded that every copy of this video that you're about to see be impounded and destroyed. So please do pass it around. September 2009. Back in September, we were working with a bunch of climate change activists to plan an event in Washington, D.C. We wanted to make a political point about an organization that's pulling off some of the world's biggest hoaxes. No, not this organization. The one across the street. The one that looks like a U.S. government office, but really is working against the government. In reality, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce is a large corporation that is reported to lie to the public on behalf of even bigger corporations. They spend nearly half a million dollars a day trying to convince the U.S. government to do really stupid shit, like killing environmental regulations and undermining workers' rights. But since they spend so much money on their hoaxes, many people believe them. And as it says, American Free Enterprise dream big, but their dreams are our nightmares because their plans are to prevent us from passing climate change legislation, which means we're screwed. Since the chamber was hoaxing us all and threatening our survival, we decided to fight fire with fire we would reveal one of their biggest lies by masquerading as them. We would hold a press conference as the chamber at the National Press Club. But first, we sent out a parody press release from them. It was sort of like their normal ones, except ours was sane. How would the world react to the chamber suddenly reversing its position on climate change? A reversal on climate change from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. It will reverse its position on the climate change bill and once a carbon tax, if you will. All right, so the U.S. Chamber is denying it now. All right, so maybe not. Apparently it was a hoax. Either there is a group or some people or a person. Is there any involvement of the White House whatsoever? Uh, I couldn't even begin to go there, Larry, on, on that one. Today, the country's largest business lobby, the Chamber of Commerce, got punked. It began early this morning when a press release went out, purportedly from the United States Chamber of Commerce. Amazingly, the release said that the chamber would now support this legislation that it's spent months fighting against. Reporters were surprised and probably confused at this odd turn of events, but that was nothing compared to what actually happened at the press conference when it was held later on this morning. Watch this tape. Clean coal is, is a, a technology that has not only not been proven, it basically doesn't exist. Okay, this is, uh, I'm Eric Walschlegel, I'm with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Um, this is not an official U.S. Chamber of Commerce event. Um, so, I don't know what pretenses you're here. I know some of you uh, in the press world, but this is a fraudulent press activity and a stunt. Who are you really, sir? 
And do you have a business card? Are you with the U.S. Chamber? I, I do. We can discuss afterwards. Okay. Can but I see your business card? Can I see yours? Are you here representing the U.S. Chamber of Commerce? Yes, I am. Okay, well, I work there, and you do not look familiar to me at all. Could I see your business Is this card? A stunt? Could I see your business Is this card? A stunt? Are you interrupting a president? Yes, I am. And, uh, this guy does not represent the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Can we finish the Okay. No. This is not an official Chamber of Commerce. This is not. Uh, what is your position at the Chamber of Commerce? I just spoke my position. We've got a working. What is your What is your title and your official title at the U.S. Chamber? I'm of the Commerce. assistant to Mr. Donahue. Okay. okay. This guy is a fraud. He's lying. Um, this is, you know, a stunt that I've never seen before. So if you'd like to okay. actually talk to the legitimate Chamber of Commerce, I've got my business cards outside. This gentleman, I will assure you, does not have any business cards, and he's not legitimate. Show me your business card. No, show me yours. No, show me yours. Yeah, they both look like imposters. <laughs> <laughs> what? But it's you just, got a business card? I, it's so weird, though. But you don't look familiar. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce says it was victimized. Victims of a hoax by environmental activists. They said public relations hoaxes undermine the genuine effort to find solutions on the challenge of climate change. A hoax actually led to the, the chamber admitting that there is a challenge for climate change. It seems like a good first step. So next up, hoax is about poverty, violence, education. hunger. For educa the for the education. The big education hoax. We've got the, a big education hoax in this The hoax is country. a good first step. Yeah. So that's the story, folks. Not entirely. Then they decided to use this opportunity to raise funds. Mm -hmm. They put out Google ads. And you'd click on that and it would take you to a page from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce asking you to give them $250 to help defend themselves against us. It gets even funnier. They not only use this opportunity to fundraise, but then they decided to sue us. <laughs> and by the way, we're being defended by some of the best lawyers in the world. We're being defended by the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Go to EFF.org to check them out. Sweet, wait. There's another punchline. Not only did Fox pick up our release, not only did Volschlegel come and interrupt our press conference, not only did the Chamber of Commerce try to raise funds off this event, and not only did well, they sue well, us, not only did they sue us, but they actually changed their policy two weeks later. Just today, the Chamber of Commerce changed positions, not courtesy of the yes men with right, that stunt right, right. in Washington a few weeks ago. But they're now saying, uh, surprisingly to me, and I'm glad about it, that they want to get legislation and they're now working with the sponsors of the bill. Gore saying it didn't happen because of the yes men is kind of the highest compliment we've ever been paid, I think. So if you're interested in uh, people maintaining their freedom of speech, EFF dot org is a very good organization to support and also if you're interested in basically more mayhem of this sort please do go and see the yesmen.org slash lab that is the yesmen.org slash lab where you can find out about the yes lab the yes lab is a thing we've launched to try to make this happen a lot more to pass this film around to other people because the u.s chamber of commerce wants people not to see it yeah, that's reason enough as far as we're concerned. The Chamber of Commerce needs the support of every American who gives a damn about free markets, private property, and fears creeping fascism. This country cannot afford for the insurance industry to cave. This country cannot afford for the Chamber of Commerce to cave. The Chamber of Commerce has been screwed, 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 screwed. <laughs> I'm extremely happy to be here because today is a very historic occasion for all of us at Dow and I am grateful. Let's walk that way. I am grateful. You're extremely pleased to be I'm here. I'm extremely pleased to be here. Yes, extremely pleased to be here, Steve. This is my friend Andy. And my name is Mike. Today, I'm holding the camera. And that's okay if it's, that's it's, a, it's a good thing to know. Exactly. Andy is about to go on live television in front of 300 million people. They're going to think that he represents one of the largest companies in the world. 
which he doesn't. And that's why he looks so nervous. Should I typically just look yeah. right into the camera? Okay. Andy's about to tell a really big lie, which unfortunately is gonna wipe $2 billion off one company's stock price. But before I tell you this story, one minute. I guess I should tell you how we got ourselves into this situation. Forget your troubles, come on, get happy. You better chase all your cares away. Shout hallelujah, come on, get happy. Get ready for the judgment day. The sun is shining, come on, get happy. The Lord is waiting to take your hand. Shout hallelujah, come on, get happy. We're going to the promised land. We're heading across the river. Wash your sins away in the tide. It's not so Hi. My name's Mike. I'm Andy. And uh, this is a movie in which the two of us fix the world. Aren't we fixing the world? Yes. <laughs> I'm scared. <laughs> What we do is pass ourselves off as representatives of big corporations we don't like. We make fake websites, then wait for people to accidentally invite us to conferences. My name is Fred, I'm from Halliburton. My name is Hannaford Schmidt. I'm with the World Trade Organization, I'm from Arizona. Uh, my name is Francisco Guerrero. Oberlu Hawkmax. Hundreds of oil and gas executives were duped today. Louisiana officials are taken for a ride by the Yes Men. The Yes Men? The Yes Men, anti-globalization activists that travel the world pulling pranks at corporate events. And a bunch of lefty protesters. World-renowned troublemakers. Sick, twisted, cruel. And, and what they do is really to take absurd ideas and they present these ideas in all seriousness. The group has done this many times before. They have a track record of getting away with it. So, how did this happen? Equity International says the imposter showed up... At home in our underground headquarters, it was time to start planning our next mission. Tens of thousands of Iraqis have died. Worries are growing among top government and business leaders about the surge of food riots. Markets continue to shake. Unemployment is up. The oil companies reported the highest profits in the history of the world. But with so many things going wrong, who should we go after next? We got our answer when a text message arrived. Dow Chemical had just bought Union Carbide, a company that became infamous in the 1980s. You remember the 1980s. Challenger, Chernobyl, Bhopal. Bhopal? In 1984, when Union Carbide's pesticide plant at Bhopal exploded, at least 5,000 people died within weeks, and 100,000 more remained sick for life. It was the biggest industrial disaster in history, but Union Carbide settled with the Indian government for $470 million, meaning most of the victims got less than $1,000 each. Now, I just want to say to shareholders of Union Carbide, that I am confident that the victims can be fairly and equitably compensated without a material adverse effect on the financial condition of Union Carbide Corporation. There was little adverse effect on the shareholders, but in Bhopal, people continued to suffer. When Dow announced it would buy Union Carbide, there was finally hope for justice. Dow said it would compensate victims of Carbide's past negligence and promptly paid over $2 billion to 14 asbestos plaintiffs in Texas. 
Dow could do for Bhopal what they'd done for Texas. But we knew they wouldn't. So we decided to do it for them. We set up a fake Dow chemical website, DowEthics.com, and we waited, and waited, and waited. Then one day, we got our chance. You have mail. We'd just been invited to a conference on international finance. Some of the biggest banks in the world would be there. These were the kind of banks who help companies like Union Carbide and Dow do what they do. A company might say, we're going to build a shoddy plant in an underdeveloped country with a corrupt legal system. The plant might explode and people might die, but we'll make a lot of money. And the bank comes back and says, great, sounds like a plan. What could we possibly do to show bankers what was wrong with this logic? So right now I'm painting Gilda, the gilded skeleton, actually the golden skeleton that we're going to use in the Dow Chemical Lecture in London at a financial services conference in just a few short days. The only good skeleton is a gold skeleton. In case Gilda didn't scare them enough, we had a backup plan. We rented a theatrical pyrotechnics unit here so that we can oh, yeah, make a big puff of smoke. Ah! Oh my God. We're on our way to a conference, and Erastus Ham is going to be speaking at the conference as Dow Chemical Company. Our plan was to have Dow demonstrate for the first time ever, exactly how they calculate the cash value of human life. Would this make the bankers think twice? It was time to find out. Thank you very much. On May 1st, we are releasing the beta version of Acceptable Risk, the world's first market smart risk calculator to help you find out instantly what risks are or are not acceptable from a bottom line business perspective. Will Project X be just another skeleton in the closet? Something your company comes to regret? Or will it be a golden skeleton? A complex case is IBM's sale of uh, technology to World War II Germany for use in identifying uh, certain populations. This was very bad, of course. But no one can deny they were profitable. And although the issue remains a skeleton in the closet, in retrospect, it is quite clearly golden. Now, you may have heard the joke. How many Americans does it take to screw in a light bulb? 12. One to climb the ladder and 11 to file the lawsuit. <laughs> what about Indians? Oh, just one. We would, of course, uh, never wish to imply that an Indian life is worth more or less than another. I myself believe in the sanctity of all life. But the market has its own logic, and if we're willing to live with it, we must make the most of the choices it makes. Because if there's one thing that we at Dow want you to remember today, it's that the only good skeleton is a gold skeleton. <laughs> this is Gilda. She's the mascot for the Dow Acceptable Risk Program. Gilda is here to basically tell you that if you have a skeleton in the closet, it may not be just a skeleton. It could very well be a golden skeleton as well. And as you move into a future of ever-increasing complexity and ever-increasing opportunities, Dow Acceptable Risk can assure you that your touch will be the Midas one. <laughs> And I'd like to finish with a little uh, poem. I'd rather be handsome than homely. I'd rather be youthful than old. If I can't have a bushel of silver, I'll do with a barrel of gold. So thank you very much. We hope you come up and get a closer look. Thank you. Hello, oh, thank you for having us. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Here's a keychain. Thank you very much, absolutely. 
Thank you. Yeah, oh, I don't have a, uh, unfortunately, I don't have a card anymore. I've oh. ran out of them. So. Oh, wonderful. Yes, you were one of the earlier speakers. Thanks. Yes, so Good. that's a pleasure. Thank you very much. It's definitely very interesting. Is yeah. it applicable? Is your model applicable to anything? I mean, is it applicable? Can we use it in risk management? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll have our risk management guys take a look at it because we, we do a lot of interesting things. So. Wonderful. Okay. This is interesting. So. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thank you. Okay, take care. Yes, hello. Hello, sorry. <laughs> your, what your case was, I want to uh, introduce a new product on the market. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And, and you, as I understood it, uh, is that your, your risk assessor will work out what is the human um, That's right. impact, impact threat, threat to, to the humans, as opposed to the how much money can you make us. Whichever way you do this, you go to cost some lives. Right? Yeah, yeah, but, well, but yeah. But if you're going to make some money in the process of it, yeah, then yeah. it's acceptable. <laughs> <laughs> Is that right? Is you that, will. That's that's, that's pretty yeah. much, yeah, that's exactly yeah. what I said. I mean, it's... Uh, it's so, uh, did you find that not... Uh, no, I, I, I thought it was refreshing, actually. Okay. Refreshing? We'd meant to be shocking, not refreshingly honest. To us, this was about as refreshing as the Kool-Aid in Jonestown. The mass suicide and murder of more than 900 Americans took cyanide-laced fruit punch from their spiritual father and then lay down to die. That's the thing about cults. What's shocking to outsiders seems normal to insiders. Is this why unfettered greed seemed normal to bankers? And if so, who was the cult leader here? This is Milton Friedman. We were told that he was the world's most influential economist. Did government play a role in this? Very little. Only by keeping the road clear for human greed and self-interest to promote the welfare of the consumer. In this book, Friedman used the word freedom 374 times. But by freedom, he didn't mean this. He meant this the freedom of corporations to profit, no matter the risk to people, and without interference from government. Dr. Milton Friedman, a scientist, a careful thinker, and a great teacher. The hero of freedom, Milton Friedman. I sought out Dr. Friedman and had the great pleasure and privilege of meeting him and his economist wife, Rose. And we've all become friends, and now I call him Milton. If we wanted to understand the banker's mindset, we needed to find the guru of greed. There was only one problem. But though Friedman had now ascended, his followers carried the flame. OK, so we should go in there. Yeah. Oh, great. Thank you. Uh, Uncle Milty. <laughs> These guys belong to free market think tanks, which have spent billions of corporate dollars trying to make us all believe that if we just let corporations do what they want, everything will work out great. We're kind of on a quest. We want to fix the world, and we want to know how to do it. Private property, rule of law, and the, a market unrestricted by government regulation and control. When, when we see companies demonized, we should um, but work against that. When we see the free market system castigated, we must work against that. More wealth leads to greater efficiency and greater innovation um, and basically all good things. Wealth, money, privatization, wealth, money, individualist freedom, privatization, free markets, ownership, and a great deal of money. Capitalism and freedom, wealth and prosperity. We were getting the message, and so were millions of others. These guys spread Friedman's free market gospel by any means that they can, like speaking to Congress, viral videos, and guest spots on Sunday morning talk shows. They claim to have derailed the Kyoto Protocol and to have helped destroy regulation around housing, banking, energy, and the environment. They agreed to meet pretty much anyone with a camera, even us. You see there's a, a blue screen behind you. Mm -hmm. um, what would you like to be put in front of? Uh, a planet Earth. Oh, cool, a blue screen. I'd say the Jefferson Monument. 
How about Jefferson Memorial? That's it's more. It's already it's, taken. Oh, it is taken. Somebody asked for that already. I'm, I'm sure you have a good backdrop of Washington. Don't put me in front of anything in Washington. I hate Washington. Put up a scene in outer space or something. You know. I would say a world in which uh, man is treated as an end in himself rather than a tool to be manipulated by those with political power. How can we represent that? Is there a single image or a, a series of images? I think that the, the images are uh, of men, um, just the prosperity of free men following what their hearts and desires lead them to. Okay. Can you find that? Sounds good. Now that we had our new friends at ease, it was time to ask them the really tough questions. What would you say to people who harp on uh, the Bhopal catastrophe or other tragedies? Uh, Bhopal is an interesting example, but that facility had created educational opportunities for an Indian emerging technocratic class. It had created value added and tax base for the community, and something like 3,000 people died. That's a tragedy, but there are always risks of going into the future. There are always risks of going into the future? For thousands of people in Bhopal, there was no future. At least the Jonestown suicide cult killed only themselves. The free marketeers seemed willing to put everyone else at risk. Back at home. You had new mail. We had mail. Turned out our Dow site was the gift that kept on giving. This time, it wasn't a mere conference. We'd hit the jackpot. The BBC, perhaps the world's most respected news organization, was doing a big broadcast about Bhopal, and they wanted to know whether Dow might finally clean up their mess. The interview, they said, would be broadcast to 300 million people. This was what we'd been waiting for. To the BBC's great surprise, Dow emailed back to say they would be delighted to speak publicly about the catastrophe. As for us, 300 million people was about a million times bigger than any other audience we'd ever had. We were scared. So we asked the BBC if instead of coming to their headquarters in London, we could meet them in neutral territory, the original land of revolution. <laughs> Are you a little nervous? I'm so nervous. Oh, God. It's like going to the guillotine. <laughs> I think it's right near where they used to have the guillotine, too, in Paris. The office. Hmm. Yeah, I think it's the biggest thing we've ever done. This. I haven't combed my hair in like 20 years. years, yeah, really. Like, I think I used to do it this way. All right. Oh, God. Oh, God. When we acquired Union Carbide three years ago, we knew what we were getting, and today we are prepared to do the obvious. Let's see, um, don't, don't film too much when we get there, I think. Hi. And you're watching BBC World, our main headlines. The world's worst industrial accident is being remembered in India today. It's 20 years since deadly gas leaked from the Union Carbide chemical plant in the city of Bhopal. At least 18 thousand deaths are attributed to the leak, yes. and many local people say the contamination has never been properly cleared up. Yeah. Great. Should I typically just look yeah. right into the camera? Okay. The factory still exists here, and that's been a real problem for the people living here locally. I mean, the site, I've been to it, and it's full of toxic waste. People who are living in these houses, they've all got a story to tell One. about that day 20 years ago. Many of them lost members of their family, and they say that they're continuing to suffer because of the tragedy. And they're saying, somebody needs to answer for this. Legally, what they're saying is that they want to 
pursue the company to try and clean up the site, but whether the company will accept liability seems doubtful. Well, joining us live from Paris now is Jude Finisterra. He's a spokesman for Dow Chemicals, which took over Union Carbide. Uh, good morning to you. Um, a day of commemoration in Bhopal. Do you now accept uh, responsibility for what happened? Steve, yes. T today is a great day for all of us at Dow and I think for millions of people around the world as well. It's 20 years since the disaster and today I'm very, very happy to announce that for the first time Dow is accepting full responsibility for the Bhopal catastrophe. We have a $12 billion plan to finally, at long last, fully compensate the victims, including the 120,000 who may need medical care for their entire lives, and to fully and swiftly remediate the Bhopal plant site. Now, when we acquired Union Carbide three years ago, we knew what we were getting, and it's worth $12 billion. $12 billion. We have resolved to liquidate Union Carbide this nightmare for the world and this headache for Dow, and use the $12 billion to adequately compensate the victims. Uh, Jude, that, that's good news that you have finally accepted responsibility. Uh, some people would say too late. It's three years, yes. you know, almost four years on. When we acquired Union Carbide, we did settle their liabilities in the United States immediately. And we are now, three years later, prepared to do the same in India. We should have done it three years ago. We are doing it now. And I would also like to say that this is no small matter, Steve. This is the first time in history that a publicly owned company of anything near the size of Dow has um, performed an action which is significantly against its bottom line simply because it's the right thing to do. And our shareholders may take a bit of a hit, Steve, but I think that if they're anything like me, they will be ecstatic to be part of such a historic occasion of doing right by those that we've wronged. Just to uh, reiterate what Jude Finisterra, the spokesman for Dow Chemicals, has just said, he says Dow Chemicals now fully accept responsibility for the events in Bhopal. Great. That's it. Well done. Great. Now they want to. Radio. I can tell you one thing. We're not going out of business. We will continue to make profit. We will simply make slightly less profit than normal. But we are doing the right thing. We're comparing here, though, the value of money to the value of human life. And there is no comparison. It's a, it's a good thing to announce. Exactly. I mean, how often does Dow get to, yeah. you know? <laughs> it wouldn't be, I wouldn't want to be a Dow spokesperson otherwise. Good. Oh my god. Oh my god. I'm gonna have a serious nervous breakdown now. Dow accepts responsibility for Bhopal, dash dash, spokesman. Where is that? In Reuters. Congratulations, your PB appearance. Everyone here at BBC cheered. It's over an hour and it's still headline news. Hello, this is Jude. Uh, who has said that? Perhaps they're not in communication with the Dow, um, with the Dow leadership. Hello? Yes, this is Jude Finisterra. Sure. Right. Sure. Right. Uh, let me just, uh, yes, could I ask you to either or to hold for a moment? Okay, thank you. They, they know. Yeah. So now, I guess, I just basically come clean, right? Well, I wouldn't say it's a hoax. It's an honest representation of what Dow should be doing. This morning, a false statement was carried by BBC World regarding responsibility for the Bhopal tragedy. The individual who made this statement identified himself as a Dow spokesperson named Jude Finestra. 
Dow confirms that there was no basis whatsoever for this report. Well, earlier today, we carried an interview with someone purporting to be from Dow Chemical, a company which subsequently bought the plant from Union Carbide. This interview was inaccurate and part of an elaborate deception. Take a look at this Dow. Like, look at this. This is the top of Google News. Dow said on Friday there was no basis whatsoever in a BBC World Report saying it had accepted responsibility for India's Bhopal disaster. That's a funny sentence. The hoax was an elaborate one involving a fake website. Dow Chemicals was quick to issue a series of statements denying all knowledge of a Jude Finisterra. Also tonight backtracking because of this man. We're going back to the BBC television studio right now that we were at this morning because they want to talk to us. I thought, well, okay, what do they want to know? Well, let's go see. So your real name is Andy, right? Yeah. Hello. I did die. I don't know. No, I... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, when, did the, uh, when did it occur to you to pull this off? It didn't occur to us at all. We, we got contacted by you guys. You also have the Dell share price. Yeah, I did hear that. Has it half percent, uh, gone back up? Or? Back to it. Well, the prank which briefly knocked 3% off Dow shares comes 20 years to the day after the chemical leak from the Union Carbide plant in Bhopal. Today's unlikely corporate humiliation of a U.S. chemical giant was all about reminding the world that Bhopal remains an unhealed sore. Well, earlier I spoke to Andy Bicklebaum and I asked him what he did when he got an email from the BBC asking him for an interview. Essentially, Dow has been uh, promulgating a hoax um, by which they've convinced people that they can't do anything about Bhopal, that they cannot accept responsibility. And we wanted to prove that that was not accurate. They, I mean, it is nevertheless a pretty cruel trick to play on the people of Bhopal. Well, we... Did you think um, about the people of Bhopal when you, when you, when you decided to peddle this stunt? Yes, yes, we did. And well, that surely is the tragedy of, them... of today. You spring upon them the, the actual hoax that they, they actually suddenly believe that they have got a payout from Dow, and, uh, and then, you know, an hour or two later, they find it's untrue. Let's put this in contrast. I mean, we may have given uh, two people two hours of false hope. Dow has given them 20 years of suffering. I mean, Are this you, is, um, this is ex what we're expecting with. the next knock at the door to be Dow's lawyer? No idea what Dow will do. Dow's lawyers didn't call, and millions of people learned for the first time that 20 years on, Bhopal was never cleaned up. But the media also reported that many of the victims in Bhopal cried tears of joy upon hearing the news, and were then bitterly disappointed. Had we actually upset the people we'd meant to help? There was only one way to find out. Here we are, or in India. Hey. <laughs> and this is Bhopal. Bhopal is a big city. There's over a million people here. Unfortunately, we heard from a lot of uh, news reports that the victims here in Bhopal were extremely upset because we had raised false hopes about uh, them actually getting some compensation after 21 years. What do you think they'll do? Uh, well, I don't know. I mean, what's the local custom here? I mean... <laughs> We're here at the Sambhavna Clinic, and this place was set up by a bunch of people uh, to help treat the gas victims of the worst industrial accident in history. So p patients come in from here. This is a forum, basically, where we uh, determine their history of gas exposure, where how far they were living, or they were they sleeping in a tent that night, and then their severe degrade is determined. These are some of the disabled children, and every uh, system of the body has been affected. You know, the musculoskeleton, the nervous system. 40% yeah. of the women coming here under 40 have menopause. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> this is 
We got the news that Dow is willing to pay $12 billion. I mean, first we just, we felt it, the news was too good to be true. Uh -huh. And Dow was too bad for the news to be true. Yeah. But still we thought maybe it is true. Maybe yeah. they've just seen sense in this. Yeah. Uh, it, I mean, for about an hour, yeah. we were under that impression. Yeah. Did people cry with joy? Yeah. I cried. Yeah, oh, no. I know lots of people cried. Were you kind of angry at first, though, when you heard it was a, a hoax? No, I wasn't angry. No. Wow. You think it was worth it? Totally worth okay. it. Okay. We are saying no more Bhopal. What people have gone through here, no one else in the world should go through this. I think we're in uh, Shiv Shivaji Nagar. And it's been a little bit of a, a bit of a, a well, a, a bit of a, <laughs> a maze getting here. A little, what, what do you call that? We got lost. We got lost. That's what it's called. We're trying to meet up with a journalist to interview, and we got lost. Oh, here he is. Here he is. Oh my God. Okay. Rajkumar Kaswani broke the disaster story. In fact, he broke it years before it actually happened. So you had already predicted how many times that the, the, the disaster would happen before it happened? Uh, in newspapers, four times. Once to the chief minister, dozens of times to the local legislators, and uh, once to the Supreme Court. I'm the most unfortunate person in this world who has got the recognition for his failure. I, had, I, had I succeeded, it wouldn't have happened. When you heard it was a hoax, the thing that we did, were you like, what did you think of it I at first? That, I, I thought that was a wonderful thing to do. We were put into a situation which we never thought of that would actually happen. So, so it is just like being in the heaven. Because I'm sure I'm not going to be in the heaven. So, so, so if one, if if I'm expecting hell, and suddenly someone puts me for the while in the heaven, so I said, okay, thanks. <laughs> Twenty years since the disaster, the poisons left behind at the plant were still leaching into the groundwater. Communities that you see in red have not gotten a single drop of clean water. Mm -hmm. Oh, really? Yeah. Until now? Until now. Eight communities are getting about 12% of the requirement. But this is contaminated water. Some of them use to drink, uh, cook, wash clothes. Dow could clean up their mess, but they didn't. Instead, they spent tens of millions of dollars on an ad campaign to clean up their image. For each of us, there's a moment of discovery. And just then, in the flash of a synapse, we learn that life is elemental. And in the dazzling brilliance of this knowledge, we may overlook the element not listed on the chart. Its importance so obvious, its presence is simply understood. The missing element is the human element. And when we add it to the equation, the chemistry changes. The human element is the element of change. The human element. Nothing is more fundamental. Nothing more elemental. This is Kevin Finn. He trades bonds. This is what I do, sit here and just look at this screen for, you know, 12 and 14 hours a day. It's very romantic, actually. More than anyone else we knew, we thought Kevin could explain why Dow wouldn't do anything to fix Bhopal. He told us what happened when Andy went on the BBC. I got a call from my clerk in the middle of the night. Dow Chemical 
made some announcement that uh, the stockholders of Dow Chemical didn't like because Dow stock went down. The S&P 500 futures went down. You know, I had to go roll out of bed. My clerk's like freaking out because my position's going against me. My friend uh, tells me he thinks it's, uh, you know, some global conspiracy of uh, traders to try to screw us. And, uh, you know, it finds out it's two jokers. The effect of our big announcement on the BBC was that Dow's stock lost over $2 billion in 23 minutes. This tells me all the news that's happening in the world. So on December 3rd, uh, if I was sitting here watching this, it would say, you know, Dow Chemical uh, decides to settle with the Bhopal people. And then people that own Dow Chemical would be like, ah, sold. Everybody we talked to about that was really happy that Dow was doing the right thing. Like, <laughs> sure. Sure, okay. I mean, I, I, I'm not uh, saying that they shouldn't be. Uh, I'm just saying that, uh, sure, it seems like a good thing, unless I guess you're a Dow Chemical stockholder and you're expecting the $20 billion to go towards a dividend to come back to you or to come to buy some new chemical plant, and it's going to these uh, people that, uh, at least at this point, don't, aren't able to get any money. I mean, I, I would see, you could see how that would, how they could be upset about that, right? We were confused. As kids, we learned that it was bad to do something bad. And if you did something good, you got a reward. Yet when we announced Dow would do something great, the market gave Dow a spanking. So how could we get companies to do the right thing? We needed to change the rules of the market. But that meant regulation, and regulation meant government. The only problem was, government was drinking Friedman's free market Kool-Aid. Free markets are working miracle after miracle of economic growth. Open markets and rule-based trade are the best engines we know of. But when the government stepped back and let the free enterprise system do its work, then the better we did, the more robust our economy grew, the better I did, and the better my business grew. For the last 30 years, the leaders of most powerful countries did whatever the free marketeers recommended. And what they recommended was simple. The solution is not uh, to have government to intervene or regulate in some way. In fact, most problems will, will, will solve themselves if ignored yeah. and let, let uh, free people that working in, in free markets uh, address them. Following advice like this, governments around the world got rid of a whole bunch of regulations meant to protect people, like in banking. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm confident that uh, um, the degree of harm or spillover effect, uh, whatever uh, sub uh, uh, subprime mortgages go bad, that the market will devise ways to, uh, to minimize and diffuse the negative effects. Their faith in the market was unshakable. But we all know what happened next. Now with the world's largest insurance company, AIG, on the brink of collapse, it could mean devastation way beyond Wall Street. What other disasters weren't coming? Global warming is silly. It's not a serious issue. Warmer is healthier, uh, and warmer is more pleasant, and that's why states like Arizona keep gaining population rapidly. Well, there are benefits to global warming. Cold-related deaths will actually decrease considerably. Just like with the subprime mortgages, our free market friends were doing all they could to stop government from intervening. Except here, the stakes were higher. I think it's quite possible that if it weren't for groups like ours, that the United States might very well be in the Kyoto Protocol by now. And if you've seen the ads that we ran about a year ago, which we produced in-house on this global warming, where our essential contention is carbon dioxide, they call it pollution, we call it life. There's something in these pictures you can't see. It's what we breathe out and plants breathe in. Carbon dioxide, they call it pollution. We call it life. We got lots of hate mail. Two senators uh, this past fall sent a letter to ExxonMobil calling on it to stop funding CEI. So Exxon was secretly paying think tanks to tell us we shouldn't regulate Exxon. Public outrage forced Exxon to stop. Um, in fact, ExxonMobil didn't fund us at all this past year. That was great, but Exxon had other ways to influence policy. 
like this guy, Lee Raymond. He's a trustee of one of the key free market think tanks. He also used to be Exxon CEO, and the year he left that job, he became an official advisor to the U.S. government on energy matters. This was scary. If we let the free market cult keep running the world, there wouldn't be a world left to fix. We had to do something. So when we heard about a huge oil conference up in Canada, we decided to go. Posing as a big PR agency, we offered them Lee Raymond, Exxon's ex-CEO, as keynote speaker. They jumped at the chance. But what they didn't know is that on the day of the talk, Raymond would be suddenly unavailable, and an assistant would step in to replace him. Okay. Yep. This keynote speech will attract substantial media coverage and will be one of the major highlights of Go Expo. What would we do to shake this audience up? It would have to be more shocking than anything we'd done before. If there's one thing that's going to be abundant in the world to come, what with climate change and all that, it's people, dead people. This is a pilot program to, to use that fuel. It's called Vivoleum, and here we are, making Vivoleum. As Lee Raymond's assistant, Andy would announce Vivoleum, Exxon's new biofuel to be made from the victims of climate change. And he'd even hand out a sample. So it started out, we made one Reggie, and then we cast a bunch of Reggies in, in wax. That's human hair right there. This is a lot of experimenting to figure out how to make a candle smell like human flesh. Ow! I lost a Reggie. Quick! Ow! We wanted to make sure that the oilmen knew what the candles they'd be holding were made of. So we'd show them a tribute video to Reggie Watts, a terminally ill Exxon janitor who had volunteered to be turned into fuel. I think I'd like to be a, I think I'd like to be a, a, a candle. I think a candle would be fun because you can, there's just so many uses for a candle. There are six billion people on this earth today. We're probably using the energies, maybe, of a billion of those at best. They had me uh, test a Hellfire missile once. That was pretty cool. We simply haven't found the miracle fuel yet to replace petroleum, but we'll eventually get there if government gets out of the way. We had his miracle fuel, and our grandfathers were turning over in their mass graves. CTV News with Barb Higgins and Daryl Chans. Good evening. A bizarre situation today at the Go Expo Energy Conference at Stampede Park. Organizers and hundreds of Alberta oil and gas executives got duped. They've been promised a major announcement from a major player in the energy industry. Attendees paid 50 bucks a head to hear this speech from the National Petroleum Council, a group that advises the White House on oil and gas matters. Welcome to Go Expo's keynote luncheon. Please welcome S.K. Wolf. First, I need to say how wonderful it is to see on all the faces here today the childlike exuberance of a great industry in full flower. And why not? Without oil, at least four billion people would starve, and starving would become the new black. But I'm not here today to pat us all on the back. I'm here to speak of Plan Bs. As Andy began outlining Exxon's tough solution to climate change, 10 volunteers passed out 300 human flesh candles. This vigil would be like no other. Who first had the idea to use the oil of a recently living animal to light his or her house? Even today, Shetland Islanders cut the heads off their puffins and put wicks in the stumps to make candles. We at Exxon firmly believe that a free market will, if left to its own devices, always find solutions to the dilemmas that humanity faces. We're calling our new technology Vivoleum. As Andy began to describe Exxon's new biofuel, the candles were lit. A strange odor rose into the air. 
What you see here is an artist's rendition of an advanced large-scale plant. The vivolium feedstock is renewable and unprecious and responds to the need of a shrinking market with greater supply. The dance of capital appears in full flower. Finally, it was time to introduce Reggie Watts, the dying Exxon janitor who had volunteered to be turned into fuel. And now we begin the tribute video to Reggie Watts. Worked in maintenance for a while. Moved up to uh, maintenance too, started doing cleanup, toxic spill cleanup. After uh, I heard from the doctor that I was gonna die, I felt like I had something to live for. Can you switch this off? Could Could this switch it off? I think I'd like to be a, a, a candle. There's just so many uses for a candle. I mean, you know, like if you, if you want something romantic, like that'd be nice to know I was a candle on table, you know, when people, uh, when they first met each other on a date. <laughs> I think that that would be great. I'd love that. That'd be, that'd be a hoot. This is a funerary observance. I mean, this guy died. Switch this off before This I man died. died. It's people. <laughs> it really is. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you very much. I'm very sorry, but we've been uh, cut off. Apparently, we're not allowed to have a funerary observance for a man who's died to make a product possible. And I'm, I'm being, uh, you, why, you, are you allowed to do that to me? I, what? Reggie Watts was an Exxon Mobil employee, and these are actually 30 or 40 percent from his, his actual life. So this time it was 80 percent? 80 percent, I'm the sorry. The remaining 20 is from what? The remaining 20 is just, you know, binders, bonders, uh, to keep it together. We have to think in Excuse such a case. What are your credentials with Exxon Mobil? What is it? Sorry? That, what part of it do you have? please, sure. So he's not with Exxon, not with National Petroleum, nothing? Boy, oh boy, you better scream them guys love better for the Now, thank you. Hey. Shut it down. Don't, don't touch my camera. Shut it down. Now. Had we actually made the oil people think about what they were doing? It was hard to tell, and there wasn't much time left to figure it out. Big oil was already destroying the planet, and not just by speeding up climate change. This house right here, it used to be on this side. Yeah, yeah, it was over here, we moved over there. You know, I could only take it like two or three days a week coming down here to work. And this year for hunting season, I mean, I didn't kill nothing. I just wasn't in the mood to kill. You know, after seeing everything else that was dead, just wasn't in the mood. I mean, you know, not that I'm a big killer, but I like killing stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's really just amazing when you go down river, some of the ponds that we used to fish in are now almost like a bay. For decades, the government had ignored scientists' warnings and let industry carve up the wetlands that protected New Orleans from storms. About a million acres of land has disappeared since 1930. It was done canal by canal, oil field by oil field, port by port, parcel by parcel. It was, if you will, death by a thousand cuts. The governing mindset, culturally and legally, was if there's an impact, We'll deal with it later. And in some ways, it's, you know, this is a preview of what the rest of this country and the rest of the world have in store for them. When Katrina hit, the wetlands weren't there to diminish its force, and the levees didn't stand a chance. So the real culprit for the destruction of New Orleans wasn't just a big hurricane, but greed dressed up as progress. What produced this tremendous improvement in technology? It was self-interest, or if you prefer, greed. The greed of producers who wanted to produce something that they could make a dollar on. Greed had caused the biggest catastrophe ever to hit the U.S. And now, 
the government was handing out billions of dollars in rebuilding contracts. In other words, letting greed solve the problem. There has been this idea that it is government's responsibility to replan the construction of New Orleans. It's better to leave it to the market. We wanted to take a closer look at how the market was fixing the U.S. Gulf Coast. We're on our way to the Gulf Coast Reconstruction Conference at the Washington Convention Center. We're going to talk to a number of people who are busy reconstructing New Orleans. Yeah, watch out. There are many silver linings to this horrendous disaster, and with it has come an incredible opportunity. I'm optimistic when I see a room full of folks who want to take advantage of the opportunities, and that's a good thing from our perspective. It's a great thing. Well, you know, it's, it's, like, it's like the Israelis say, you know, once in a while a good crisis is not bad. You come up with new things. We were seeing a lot of new things. But wasn't this supposed to be about Gulf Coast reconstruction? We're especially interested in Gulf Coast reconstruction. And uh, is this, does this have anything to do with that? This is uh, for bomb detonation and ammunition storage. Mm. Perimeter and physical security, uh, mainly anti-ram uh, road blockers. This particular unit can be used in military applications. Wow, so it's a real like catastrophe mm -hmm. toilet, basically. All this stuff would be great for the people of New Orleans if they were going to fight a war. Where was the stuff about helping people? Ah, here it was. The pavilion from Central Asia. Here gives people are ready to help the uh, people of Louisiana, Mississippi, and Alabama by erecting yurts there for them as a temporary shelter. <laughs> And here is the yurt. Oh my god. This is it. You can cover it up, build a fire, you can open it up, and if there's a flood, you can just take it up in less than an hour. And they're interested in sending one free of charge to Louisiana as a test if you're interested. So yep. The yurt was the only solution here about helping people, but the government reps didn't seem very interested. There's no money in yurts. We decided we could outdo everyone at this conference and beat the free market at its own game. We would invent the ultimate disaster technology, a device so sophisticated it could protect anyone from pretty much anything. But it would cost so much that only the richest businessmen could afford it. The only question was, what company would make such a thing? You've got to think Halliburton. For they are the ones who do the research to make the mud, to build the tool, to run in the well, to make the test, to log the zone, to set the packer, cement the pipe and fire the gun, to perforate, to pump the gel that carries the sand, that props the frack, completes the well to produce the crude that runs the world for all the people all over the earth who live in the house that oil built. Halliburton has been the world leader in extracting profit from every kind of disaster. They made billions off the first Gulf War and its sequel, and hundreds of millions off Katrina, all paid for by the U.S. government, whose vice president was once their own CEO. If anyone could make a killing from total disaster, Halliburton would be the one. This morning, we got up really early, drove up to the uh, very fancy hotel, which shall remain nameless because they threatened us uh, if we use the material <laughs> with their name. Um, but, you know, what, what are, what's it called, basically, the hotel? Ritz-Carlton. Ritz-Carlton, that one. How are you doing? I'm Northrop Goody. I'm, I'm here with Halliburton, with Fred Wolf. I'm just helping demo a product, so. Would either one of you mind helping us demo the suits? We have three of them. So you have to actually step into it, pull it on. It's Our, kind of I'll like wear a coverall. You'll wear it? I'll wear it. All right, great. No you're, a, you're a good sport. You're a really good no sport. No the Catastrophic Loss Conference was for insurance people. They knew numbers. 
and we were about to show them some pretty simple math. With Gilda, we tried scary. With Reggie, we tried gross. Now, we would go for ridiculous. Uh, we really appreciate being invited to speak on this panel. Um, a lot of you work with the insurance industry, of course. Insurance has become extremely worried about some grave new dangers to people that we're seeing in the world around us today. And I'm, of course, talking about climate change and the disasters that it brings. But I can personally guarantee you that level heads will always be able to turn lemons into lemonade. Uh, consider the Black Plague. This was an unspeakably rotten event, of course, in which one-third of Europe's population died in great agony. Uh, no one, of course, would wish such a thing on any civilization. Yet without it, without the Black Plague, the old business models of Europe would never have been overturned by the entrepreneurs of the Renaissance. And what would the world be without the Mona Lisa? Or closer to home, how about the Great Deluge? This uh, world-ending disaster, literally, was surely seen as a terrible catastrophe by Noah's contemporaries and perhaps by Noah himself. Yet Noah was ready to seize the day. And at the end of that day, not only was there a whole new world, but Noah found himself with a monopoly of the animals. Uh, for those of us in positions of responsibility, however, who might have to take charge in a crisis, even more innovative solutions are necessary. I'd like now to introduce my colleague here, Dr. Northrop Goody, who's the head of our Emergency Products Development Unit at Halliburton. And uh, Dr. Goody will be showing some mock-ups of some uh, items that his unit has developed. We want something that's going to be able to save a human being no matter what Mother Nature throws at him. And so this is the answer. This is the Halliburton Survival Ball. It's three easy steps for deployment, suiting up, inflating, and of course, launching. Launching out of a building, and we have an artist's rendition of what it might be like in Houston when we launch our Survival Balls. In the event of extreme catastrophe, there might be a scarcity of resources. In this case, we've got a Survival Ball here that's going up and extracting resources, um, in this case, from an animal. And you don't want to be exposed to the elements, but you still want to be able to extract resources from, for example, a cow. They're going to be able to go underwater, rated at 50 feet. They can be used in any condition. It doesn't matter whether you're in a landslide in California or even in the Arctic. Of course, any other conditions, whether tsunamis or um, tornadoes, the survival ball is designed to withstand. But the best part of the survival ball is that people need people. And so our biggest inspiration for the way that a community should work with survival balls comes from biology. Um, as some of you probably know, um, amoebas gather together and actually form another body. They aggregate. And so these one-celled organisms come together as a single body. For example, here's a raft formation of survival balls in the ocean, floating, communicating, exchanging nutrients, differentiating function. Last of all, this is literally thousands of survival balls uh, dancing through the streets. And um, we'll be happy to take any questions. So uh, if there are any uh, more technical ones for North or Pier or general ones? Yeah. Yep. I mean, in my mind, this clearly uh, also plays right into terrorist attacks. Uh, what kind of defense mechanisms do you envision against biological, chemical, radiological attack? Uh, if you could demonstrate the turtle position, please, that would be great. Basically, if you duck down, I'll assume they'll have some kind of bubble mask or something. Yeah, at all. yeah. visor, yeah, yeah. heads-up display, the whole thing. Very cool. so. but to me, it was just the way it fit. It was probably if you're ever going to make them, some people like yeah. you want to wear them for a long time, you have more cushioning or something. Yeah. But I can imagine they'd be pretty darn expensive to make you really market them. Well, yeah. yeah. 
they, they although, aren't. Although, although <laughs> yeah. I guess the people who want it will need them. Most of the, you know, the price should be no object, right? I mean, if you're getting, per se, the well, that's right. cabinet yep. to pick a, you know. Hi. Northrop. Gary, how are you? It's very interesting. Um, you know, one of the things that we're trying to do is modeling of terrorism around the world. So, uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, this is clearly, you know, something that plays right into that kind of an event. Well, it does. That's it. It's supposed much to more so than, you know, Katrina. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, in the event of a we've done all we could to show these people what sucked about letting greed run our future. Oh dear. But instead of freaking out, they just took our business cards. Well, wonderful, and if you want to take one of mine here. Our effort had been a failure. It's not very well articulated, really. And come to think of it, all of our efforts have been failures. You know, a yes man never gives up. We knew we could do it. All we needed was a whole new approach. Maybe making fun of stupid ideas was a stupid idea. We had to get smart because the people with the really stupid ideas were very, very smart. For Friedman and his followers, disaster was not just a chance to get rich, but an opportunity to push through all kinds of unpopular policies, like privatizing public schools, shutting down public hospitals, and kicking people out of their homes. This is the Lafitte housing project. It survived Katrina intact. That was lucky for the thousands of residents who wanted to come home and rebuild. So what did the government do? They decided to tear it down. The disaster for us started after the storm. Uh -huh. When people found out that you were gonna be marooned in a strange foreign city wanting to come home and the government was going to take your home away. This was ours before the storm. When storms happen everywhere else, people get a chance to go back home. This home to us. Why are they gonna take away our pride and joy? They don't know what people are going through. The whole city that sort of washed away. Now you gotta rebuild the whole thing. So part of what this was is if you ever had an idea that you couldn't get through before the storm, well, the storm meant that everything was, you know, tossed salad. So if this idea had been roundly rejected by the city and by voters and whatever, but now's your chance to sneak on in. When residents tried to come home after Katrina, they found themselves locked out by HUD, the U.S. government's Department of Housing and Urban Development. The federal government came up with a program to dismantle public housing. Uh, and privatize it, and uh, that's what we're doing. And so you've got to develop a nice community so that the poor have an opportunity to live in an environment where people work, that they're part of the American dream, and you'll get a number of folks that are, that are not used to the type of lifestyle that we all live, where trash is thrown on the ground or cursing off of the, the, the balcony. And the idea really is to provide role models, essentially, for, for poor folks, right? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. On the BBC, we tried to show that companies could behave differently, and we learned that they couldn't until government made rules to control them. Yet even here in New Orleans, where help was most needed, government was also drinking the free market Kool-Aid. I believe in a market-driven process. Economics, capitalism is going to take over. And the marketplace is poised to respond. So the government didn't believe in government. We knew what we had to do. 
we would become the government. And we would find out what would happen if government did the right thing. We are preparing to go to the Gulf Coast Reconstruction Conference um, at the Poncher Train Center in Kenner near the airport. You shouldn't drive. Okay. Here. So it's almost like we should be saying, we are facing a state of emergency. I'm going to speak um, as HUD, as the deputy assistant of uh, Secretary of HUD, who couldn't make it, and CNN is going to be covering it live. This conference was taking place on the first anniversary of Katrina. A thousand contractors who were rebuilding New Orleans would be there. What's that? Nagin's coming, Mayor Nagin. Oh my God. Mayor Ray Nagin coming just a bit more than we expected would happen. When we'd hatched our scheme, we told this guy, the conference organizer, that we represented Alfonso Jackson, the head of HUD. When the mayor and governor found out that Jackson would be there, they had to be there too. Once again, the keynote speaker wouldn't show up, but his assistant would. Would the mayor notice that something was wrong? And what would the contractors think of HUD's radical new approach to public housing, an approach that could cost them money and even put some of them out of a job? Please join me in welcoming Mayor Ray Nagin of New Orleans. And please also join me in welcoming Renee Oswin, the Assistant Deputy Secretary of the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. So it's an honor to um, share the stage with our two partners in recovery, with Renee Osmond representing HUD, who's definitely one of our most important partners in this rebuilding effort, and Mayor Nagin of New Orleans, whose challenges are enormous. And I also want to stop and thank Renee, who's here from HUD. HUD has been an incredible, incredible partner with us. We are on the verge of doing some really unique things, some things that we could have never tackled in the city of New Orleans. And now we are poised and positioned to enhance uh, public housing in the city of New Orleans. You know, there's lots of information out there. There's lots of misinformation out there, you know. And, uh, but I have a fundamental belief that truth and lie cannot stay in the same place at the same time. It reminds me of a story I once heard. Truth and Lie went swimming one day in Lake Pontchartrain. They went skinny dipping, so they laid their clothes on the banks, and they were out there having a really good time. But then Lie all of a sudden jumped out the water, put Truth's clothes on, and started running down Esplanade Elysian Fields Avenue. Truth got out the water, started running after Lie. So ladies and gentlemen, what you had was a well-dressed Lie being chased by naked truth. It's quite a tough act to follow, nothing like that to make you feel a bit naked, eh? Uh, <laughs> dear friends, it is with the greatest joy that I announce to you today a brand new Department of Housing and Urban Development. Everything is going to change about the way we work, and the change is going to start right here today in New Orleans. Until last week, our MO here at HUD was to tear down public housing whenever we could. Like many folks in Washington, we thought that the projects caused crime and unemployment. We were wrong. When we tore down St. Thomas and replaced it with mixed income flats, only one of 27 former residents ever made it back, and the rest have faced many problems, in some cases even homelessness. It just didn't work. We won't make that error again. This afternoon, we will begin to reopen all public housing projects in New Orleans and allow these Americans to be part of their city once again. But opening doors... But opening doors won't be enough. As you know, the main reason New Orleans was so vulnerable to Katrina was the destruction of the wetlands. I am very, very, very pleased to announce that Exxon and Shell have agreed to finance wetlands rebuilding from part of the $60 billion in profits this year. As J. Stephen Simon, Exxon Vice President, writes, ExxonMobil is earmarking $8.6 billion from revenues our company has made in this region so as to assure, assure that ExxonMobil never again has a hand in destroying a large American city. 
ladies and gentlemen, we will rebuild not just New Orleans, we will rebuild the American dream. Please come join us at the Lafitte Housing Complex for a ribbon cutting ceremony immediately after the plenary session. This is what we're all here for, so let's make it happen. Let's bring New Orleans back. I thought it was very uplifting. This has been a big problem. A lot of people want to come home and they have been unable to do so. So I thought it was a very positive uh, message. Oh, very encouraging. And what's really encouraging in particular is not only getting people back home and helping them rebuild, but the recognition that we have to deal with Mother Nature and uh, that uh, Exxon is going to make some uh, significant contribution to restore wetlands, is, it's very encouraging. This was encouraging. When the contractors heard that the government was going to do the right thing, even though it might cost them some business, they cheered. Friedman was wrong. Greed alone didn't rule the world. Hi. 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 Absolutely. Oh, okay. Thank you. And this time, we'd gotten away with it. Or so we thought. The city and the state both say they've not heard anything about this. This announcement comes as a surprise to the governor's office and the mayor's office. Why would HUD do this without consulting the city and the state? Well, it's such an, it's, it, we haven't done this without consulting with them. You have no cards. You say you're new to the agency? I have a card, but it's back at the office. I'll get it to you. Where is your PR team? I'm um, right here. Hi. There. Hi, you're with HUD? Yes, sir. I am. Do you have a car? There's an entire HUD housing project there mm -hmm. left unfinished. Yeah. There are some saying that this is a farce, that you're not truly with HUD, and that this is not an actual announcement. Well, they can say whatever they want. Who are these people? Where is your office? In Washington. Where in Washington? He did just he just joined the agency from France. He's a from France. Yeah, he's been a special uh, attaché to the Department of the Interior in France. I, why, why are you so skeptical? I just heard the speech, and I have a newscast very shortly. I need to confirm if it was a real speech from HUD or not. The governor and the mayor knew nothing of it. They were shocked. We desperately, we desperately need to know if this is, if it's, is real or not. He's standing right here, the man who just apparently committed this hoax on your department. Okay, I'm on the phone with HUD right now, and they say you're a liar. Okay, well, they can say whatever they want. I mean, I'm sorry? They can say whatever they'd like. They can say whatever they'd like. But you work for them, don't you, as a deputy secretary? That's right. Now that you've been discovered, do you want to explain to me why you did it? I mean, if you're trying to make a point, why don't you come over here and tell me why you did this? All right. All right, man. I'll call you in a few minutes. But it is a hoax, a massive hoax perpetrated today. You, you just pulled off a heck of a hoax. Thank you. It, I, I mean, I would, I would say that, you know, HUD is pulling off a hoax by, by pretending that tearing down affordable housing is what's going to solve it. I mean, that's what they've been doing until now. This is a time when all of these people are clamoring to get back in. They want to get back into their housing, and they deserve to be there. It's crazy. And, mean, worth, and worth lying to oh, absolutely. all these people. Absolutely. Actually point. telling the truth. This is actually truth telling where normally there would only be lies. How difficult would it be to remediate uh, what you see here today and make it inhabitable, say, next week? Just take off the, take off the covers here. Oh, yeah, that's a good start, yeah. Absolutely. That's it. Finally, we will be reopening public housing for the residents for the workforce that's going to move back in and again rebuild New Orleans. Sick, twisted, cruel. Those are all words used to describe the prank on Louisiana officials and about a thousand contractors in New Orleans today. I'm Deputy Assistant Secretary uh, to uh, of the assistant essentially of uh, Secretary Alfonso Jackson. Renee Oswin can't get his title right or his relationship to HUD Secretary Alfonso Jackson. After taking the mayor for a ride, these contractors followed him to a makeshift ribbon cutting at the Lafitte Housing Project. Mr. Oswin, you're not even on the directory of HUD. You're not even listed. You don't even have a phone number. It's come to that, has it? It's come to that. Well, thanks for being the one to break the news. Hanno, the Housing Authority of New Orleans, says this is simply a cruel, cruel joke, uh, trying to give people some kind of uh, fake hope that they were going to be able to move back. It is terribly sad that someone would perpetuate such a cruel hoax 
and play on the fears and anxieties of families who are desperate to return to their homes. We just had it confirmed from HUD um, that he's not actually an employee of HUD. This is all a big hoax, this whole ceremony here. But I guess it's just the call they hand. It's just the call they hand. I, I respect this host because maybe it'll take a host like this to bring them out here to see what we going through. So it's a host with it be, a host is what we got. And I ain't mad. I'm going to eat some barbecue. And I think what you guys exposed is the fact that HUD could do these great things if they wanted to. Secondly, you got the attention of the residents, so now they're going to begin to ask, well, why aren't you doing these things? And number three, you're creating a controversy to feed off, to organize, and to build a struggle to the next level. So in my opinion, everything y'all did was excellent. It had all been worthwhile. We were on top of the world. But then, reality began to sink in. We'd made a splash, but we hadn't fixed the world. The free market was still destroying New Orleans. All over the world, people were losing their homes. Climate change kept getting worse. And in Bhopal, people continued to suffer. We really did need to fix the world. But it was going to take more than two guys with cheap suits and fake websites. It would take millions of us. But even as old regimes were swept away, we knew that real change wouldn't come easy. After all, the free market cult was still here. Wealth, money, privatization, wealth, money, free markets, privatization, ownership, a great deal of money. Now, we can afford that. Remember these guys? They're not going away. And neither would we. We needed a really ambitious plan, because all we ever read in the newspapers was how we needed to put everything back on track, back to how it was before it fell apart. But how it was was the problem. We needed to show what real change could look like. So together with a whole lot of friends, we would blanket Manhattan with 100,000 copies of our very own newspaper. We'd call it the New York Times. Except our New York Times would be a little bit different. Ours would be set six months in the future. It would show what could happen if we set our imagination free. Things have gotten pretty bad, and I think it's hard for people to imagine the world working another way. So we're trying to, as realistically as possible, present this world as it could be. They just uh, brought out the uh, proof of the New York Times, and it looks unfucking believable. Really good. The obvious question, how the heck did you do it? And you want to start? How long were you working on this thing? And how many of you? Well, there were a lot of us. It wasn't just the Yes Men. It was a large group of people. We were just one of many groups. It was an idea that sparked a lot of people's imaginations. They wanted to see this happen. And that's sort of the message of the paper as well, is that, great, we elected Obama, and that's fantastic. But now the real work begins. The idea was to put out something that was optimistic, that says, we can do all these things. Why not? We created the system that we have now, so why not create a good one instead? Wow. <laughs> this is the big day. 7 a.m. rush hour. This is the time to get the papers out there. Three, 
three times. Special issue. Special issue. Fake, right? Who publishes this? Can I grab another one, please? <laughs> what? What? The National Health Insurance Act passes. So the Patriot, the Patriot Act repealed. Maximum wage law succeeds. Good luck with that one. This is too good to be true. <laughs> but it's not impossible. It's a dream newspaper, right? It's like you wake up and all the things that you wanted became the news. The war's over! A fake news was a hit. But would the real news pick it up? You don't work for the New York Times. Who is it that you work for handing this out? A guy named John, John, John Smith. Who? Yeah, John, John Smith. John Smith. It's a New York Times special edition. Is there anything wrong with it? I mean, well, yeah, it's, it's not the New York Times. Extra, extra, read all about it. The New York Times declares the war in Iraq is over. Some commuters got their hands on what looks like a special edition of the New York Times. As you might have guessed, though, it's a fake. Eine New York Times in die Hand gedrückt bekam, trauten jedenfalls ihren Augen nicht. George Bush wurde in Pazuta, und alles reißt bei neuesten offiziellen Erwähnungen sind nicht dastehend. We printed a paper with the headlines uh, that we'd like to see. So if these are the headlines that people were so excited to read this morning, um, let's make them happen. I think it's gonna, it's gonna, we have to exercise some muscles we either don't have or that have atrophied or something, a civic muscle, a thrifty muscle, a generous muscle. We've got to take back our government. March into City Hall and say, here, we've got the solutions. We can. Think of the different ways that we can contribute to a movement that says business as usual is unacceptable because people are being hurt and we're not going to play the role, the subservient, routine role that we usually play. Let's go. Make change happen. Put, you know, put your effort on the line to make something happen. And that's what kind of we did here. And, you know, maybe it's what, yeah, it's kind of, yeah. And oh, boy. No, I know, yeah. Well, <laughs> and if a few people at the top can make the bad news happen, then why can't all of us at the bottom get together and make the good news happen for a change? I mean, for real. very own copy of that fake New York Times, all the news you could see, go to theyesmen.org slash store. And if you want to see a lot more of this stuff happen, visit theyesmen.org slash lab. Sign up to participate.